today I'm going to talk about uh, two topics that are actually uh, in a way related, uh, as I will make clear somewhere halfway. And those two topics are uh, the environmental Kuznets curve and environmental justice. Uh, I think the latter topic is the more interesting and the more important one. Uh, but um, the first one actually has attracted much more attention in the literature. Um, this is where we are in the schedule. Uh, this is week 10. Uh, out of 11 weeks, as you know, we will have a three week uh, Easter break after this, but we will continue, we will return for week 11 when I'm going to talk about uh, green accounting. Um, for those of you who have not have uh, had enough of me, uh, next term I will essentially do the whole thing again under the heading of climate economics, uh, which is essentially an application of everything we've talked about uh, to one particular problem, climate change, as you may have guessed. Uh, and it's not just an application, it's actually also a substantial uh, deepening of the topic. For those of you who are going to do that, the uh, textbook was published last week. Here it is, one of the very first copies. Um, this month and next month you can get it half price at the publisher. After that it will be uh, twice as expensive. Uh, this is of course only for those who will return next uh, term. Um, but let's talk about what we're going to talk about uh, today, that is the environmental Kuznets curve. Uh, first of course the question, what is the environmental Kuznets curve? Or rather, what is the Kuznets curve? The Kuznets curve was named after Simon Kuznets, uh, who you see here. Uh, Kuznets um, is an early Nobel laureate uh, in economics, um, particularly for work related to what you see displayed here. He is also the guy who invented uh, gross domestic uh, product. Um, and um, the thing that you see displayed here is the Kuznets curve, not the environmental Kuznets curve, the Kuznets curve. Um, and uh, Kuznets uh, contended that um, very poor societies were egalitarian, that is everybody was equally poor. Very rich societies are egalitarian, everybody's roughly equally rich. Uh, but in between you have this phase where there is growing inequality in income. Uh, and that is suggested in this graph here. Where on the horizontal axis you see the log of GDP per capita. And on the uh, vertical axis you see the Gini uh, coefficient, which is an indicator of inequality uh, in the income distribution. And uh, a low Gini means everybody earns the same, a high Gini means uh, some people uh, uh, earn most everything there is uh, in a society. Um, <clears throat> uh, so Kuznets uh, posed this. Uh, it's not entirely true <laughs> for um, uh, income, uh, but nevertheless uh, that name stuck and it has been applied to the environment uh, as well. And the uh, Idea you see sort of here uh, that if we look through the stages of development as we grow richer over time, that's on the horizontal axis, on the vertical axis you're looking at pressure on the environment or environmental degradation, that societies that <clears throat> are very underdeveloped uh, don't pose much pressure on the environment. Um, then as they industrialize, they start using heavy industry, start emitting more, and they put more pressure on the environment. Uh, but then in post-industrial economies, service economies, uh, the pressure on the environment drops again. That is the idea behind uh, the environmental uh, Kuznets curve. Uh, this was popularized uh, by the two gentlemen that you see here, Grossman and Kruger. They were not the first to say this, but they were uh, the most prominent people to say it early. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Kruger, uh, of course, uh, tragically died just before he would, be, uh, would have been awarded the Nobel Prize. Um, 
but actually his most cited work is not on his favorite topic of labor theory or identification. His most uh, cited paper is exactly uh, this one on the environmental uh, Kuznetsker. Um, <clears throat> so this is the basic theory. Poor societies pose little pressure on the environment, rich societies pose little pressure on the environment, and in between societies pose a lot of pressure on the environment. Um, that's the theory, how true is this in practice? Well, if we actually go back to the very first paper on this, or almost uh, the first paper by uh, Grossman and Kruger, um, <coughs> you actually see uh, this, so in the top left, we're looking at sulfur uh, dioxide emissions um, and income. Not really a bell-shaped curve. Uh, we're looking at uh, smoke, suits and that sort of stuff, where you do with a little bit of imagination see uh, a bell curve, albeit not a symmetric one. Um, and um, at the bottom, uh, you're looking at heavy uh, particles, uh, which also definitely does not have a bell-shaped uh, curve. Um, so these are some of their results. Here are more results. Uh, we're looking at uh, dissolved oxygen in rivers. You know, you sort of like see the start of a bell curve, but not really the bell itself. Um, biological oxygen, um, so dissolved oxygen top uh, left, uh, biological oxygen demand, uh, top right. Maybe a bell curve, it may be just a bit flat, right? Uh, chemical oxygen demand uh, seems more like a bell curve. Uh, nitrates in rivers does sort of seem to adhere, adhere to uh, the environmental Kuznets curve. Um, but if we then look at fecal coliform, that's essentially shit, uh, in water, in, in rivers, Perhaps, right? <laughs> but if you look at total coliform in rivers, this is most definitely not a bell-shaped uh, curve, right? Um, and they continue uh, with looking at lead, come back to lead, looking at cadmium, looking at arsenic, looking at mercury, and looking at nickel, and you already begin to get the gist of the story, right? Environmental Kuznets curve is a nice theoretical concept, but it does not really show up in uh, the data. Um, and they, of course, did not just show these graphs, they also ran a whole bunch uh, of regressions. Um, and what you see is uh, actually not the regression results, but some of the, res the interpretation of this. Uh, so the peak GDP, that's the first column. So in, in this column, we're looking at the environmental pollutants. Um, and this is where is the top of the peak. And what you see, if you go through this quickly, is that it ranges somewhere between 11.6 thousand for cadmium, and uh, if I look correctly, uh, 2700 for dissolved oxygen. So if there's a curve, it's most definitely not uniform. But if you also, if you look at some of the standard errors, right? So going back to dissolved oxygen, the peak is at 2700, plus or minus uh, 5300. Right, so this is just completely undefined, right? There may be a peak somewhere, but it's somewhere between, with a 70% confidence, um, somewhere between minus 3,500 and, uh, what is it, uh, 8,000, right? That is where the peak lies. So it's just empirically uh, fairly uh, weak. Um, <clears throat> um, now, this was published in a very... Um, prominent journal, and Grossman was already at the time a very prominent economist, uh, so people set up and thought, we can do this too, right? And there, I haven't counted, but there is a large, a large number of papers uh, on this, because this is the sort of stuff that basically anybody with an undergraduate degree in economics can do. Uh, you all by now have the econometric skills 
to run uh, an environmental Kuznets curve analysis. Um, and journals have been inundated with uh, submissions uh, on this. Um, and it's not just that people ran the same thing as they did. Of course, that is not publishable, but you can look at different indicators of environmental quality. And uh, what definitely has happened since 1991, when this was first done, uh, is that there's more and more data have come online for more and more countries and more and more environmental indicators, right? And every time a new data set comes online, somebody thinks, let's run uh, another analysis of, of the environmental Kuznets curve. Um, it's also true for a whole bunch of different countries. And of course, time progresses, so we get newer data as well. Uh, so people just keep doing this. Also, I've been doing this for uh, sectors, for parts of countries, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, all the data has become available. Uh, of course, people um, want to look at different ways, different equations that have actually uh, could be estimated. Is it a quadratic relationship? Is it a cubic relationship? Do we throw in a quartic term? Do we do everything in logs? Do we do things in, uh, in hyperscience and so on and so forth? Uh, you can try all sorts of stuff there. And people have done this. Uh, and of course, uh, people also continuously invent new uh, and refined estimators over uh, the ordinarily squares uh, that you are so very familiar with. Um, and as a result, there is a large and still growing literature on this. Um, a while ago, uh, David Stern uh, and uh, Matteo Galliotti try to sort of get an overview of this literature. Uh, Stern called his paper The Rise and Fall of the EKC, uh, and Galliotti, who is a big uh, Madonna fan, those of the younger people in the audience, Madonna is, was about as big as Billy Eilish is now, um, desperately seeking the environmental Kuznets curve. And I think that neatly sums it up. If you look through this literature, you essentially go back to the early Grossman-Kruger paper, Really, it is not really in the data, really. You can't find much there. Sometimes you're lucky that you have the right set of countries in the right time period, and you find something that looks very much like an environmental Kuznets curve, but then somebody comes along and uses a slightly different estimator and the whole result disappears again. Um, and that empirical ambiguity is not at all surprising when you think about it. Because what happens if uh, or when an economy grows? What happens to our pressure on the environment? Well, it's actually, uh, according to this slide, there's five things going on. First, there is the scale of the economy. As the economy grows, there's more people doing more stuff, buying more things. And that is very, very straightforward. There's more people around, there are more people who flush their toilets, and that means that there's more sewage around. If there's more people, there's more people who cook their dinner, and therefore energy use is higher, right? That is pretty straightforward. The scale effect of the size of the economy and its pressure on the environment is uh, unambiguous and unambiguously negative for uh, the environment. <clears throat> um, so that is unambiguously negative. Uh, unambiguously positive is the fourth effect that you see here. And that is, as people grow richer, they start paying more attention to the niceties of life. They start paying more for luxury goods. And the common view is that environmental quality is a luxury good. It's only when you become richer it's not so much that you begin to care about the environment, but rather you are able to express that care. If you worry about keeping your kids warm uh, through winter, and there's no gas, there's no oil, um, there's no coal, the only thing you can do is chop down a tree, then you don't think twice about deforestation because the alternative is your family freezing to death, right? So you don't care about, well, you actually do care about the trees, you may like the tree, 
and you may like the forest and you may like the animals that live in there, but preventing your family from freezing is a higher priority, right? Um, similarly, worrying about abstract things uh, such as climate change or a loss of biodiversity actually re takes time, it takes effort, it takes education and so on and so forth. And if you're busy surviving, then you probably care about these things and you probably would care if you knew about these things, but you have other things on your mind, right? Uh, so definitely the expression of environmental care is something that richer people do more than uh, poorer people. And definitely, um, even if they were to care proportionally as much, richer people have simply a larger budget to spend on these things, right? And environmental care costs money. Uh, so we have an unambiguously negative effect, the scale effect of the economy, and we have a probably unambiguously positive effect that is uh, affluence, right? Uh, and then we have free effects um, that are actually in themselves uh, ambiguous. Um, the um, composition um, of the economy uh, is one thing that obviously changes, or the structure uh, of the economy. Poor economy. Poorer economies tend to be heavy in agriculture, richer economies tend to be heavy in services. There's a few exceptions there. Uh, but this is roughly uh, how it goes. Uh, if you have an economy that is heavy on agriculture, it uses a lot of fertilizer, it uses a lot of pesticides, those things go away if you move away from agriculture. Similarly, if you have an economy that is heavily industrialized, a lot of steel, a lot of concrete, those sort of things, you emit a lot of greenhouse gases. But if you then move to a service economy, you actually uh, get rid of some of that stuff, right? Um, but by no means this is simple or one way. Services uh, impose uh, other pressures on the economy. Um, what we've seen uh, in recent years uh, is the shift away from desktop computers and in-house servers to cloud computing with data centers and those sort of things. Actually, very energy demanding. We've seen uh, the cryptocurrencies which actually use an enormous amount of uh, electricity for mining bitcoins and those sort of things. Um, so it is not at all the case that service economies or economies dominated by the financial sector are better than economies, service economies that are less dominated by the financial sector. That simply does not hold, right? Uh, and we've also seen. Um, well, for those of you who have been paying attention, a uh, country uh, dear to my heart and not too far uh, from yours, uh, the Netherlands still is dominated, the Netherlands still has a very la large agricultural sector, right? Uh, very intensive agriculture, a lot of nitrates coming out, um, and in that sense, uh, one of the richer uh, countries in the world is actually very polluting if you focus on nitrogen uh, emissions because the country, the economy has never quite moved away uh, from agriculture in the way that other uh, rich countries have. Um, um, so it's just unclear um, what the exact effect of the structure of the economy on the environment would be. Um, similarly, uh, technology, on the one hand, new technologies tend to be better and less resource intensive uh, than older technologies. That is because resources cost money. And if you put a product on the market that uses less energy or uses less water, it's cheaper to run. And therefore people uh, would be buying your stuff uh, if you can put it on the market. Uh, so that is definitely a good thing for the environment. On the other hand, we're always inventing new things. Um, new gadgets uh, that we would like, to, all would like to have and that are creating a lot of pressure, new pressures on the environment. Um, and one example there is uh, mobile phones, electric uh, vehicles, uh, those sort of things. They all have batteries and batteries are full of very nasty chemicals. Well, they're fine as long as they're in your pocket, but as soon as you throw them away, 
they're actually chemical waste, right? 20 years ago, we used not to have mobile phones and we definitely did not have electric vehicles. So the number of batteries was simply in the waste stream was simply much smaller. So new technologies also create new environmental problems, right? Similarly for solar panels, they're full of very nasty uh, metals and chemicals. Um, and then the final thing, uh, the, perhaps the most hardest, uh, or perhaps the hardest to explain, uh, is governance. Now, richer countries tend to be governed differently than poorer countries. And that is one of the reasons, one of the differences between rich and poor is one of the reasons why poor countries are poor, because they're badly governed. Um, richer countries tend to be better governed, but also tend to be, and that means that they can do more for the environment. If you want to clean up a chemical dump in Nigeria, you can pay a hundred million uh, pounds for that, but you can be sure that 95 of the hundred million will disappear somewhere in somebody's corrupt pockets, probably end up in a Swiss bank account um, or somewhere in the Caribbean uh, in, in, in a, a tax paradise. Um, that is what tends to happen in very poor countries. Um, they're poorly governed. Now we have less of a, a corruption problem in richer countries. We do have a corruption problem in this country, but it's much less uh, than what you see in poorer countries. Um, but the problem with countries like the United Kingdom is yes, they're reasonably well governed, they're also uh, reasonably democratic. Um, and that means that it takes forever to reach a decision. Uh, one of my favorite examples is the third runway uh, of Heathrow. You're, you're all familiar with uh, the High Speed Line 2, HS2, right? And that has just the deliberations have been going on for roughly as long as you've been around, right? Uh, for quite a while. Other countries built high-speed uh, rail, no problem, uh, but the UK seems to have a problem making up its mind. Um, but a much worse example is the third runway of Heathrow that also has been with you all your life. But actually the first discussion about the third runway for Heathrow uh, was in 1947, right? With your grandfather's life, is that about right? <laughs> um, and that means that if you want to clean up something, and I mean, uh, third runway for Heathrow, on Heathrow is probably, well, maybe bad for the environment. Uh, jury is actually out uh, on that. Uh, but it also means that if you want to clean up something, that can also take a very long time before a decision is made. All right. So also this aspect of governance, it's actually uh, ambiguous. What is the relationship between economic growth and, um, and pressure on the environment? So we should not at all be surprised that the empirical literature, literature is all over the place, right? Because the theory says it should be all over the place. And that is exactly uh, what we found. Um, if there is sort of a bottom line, if there is sort of a message here, then what we sort of see that for local pollutants that are directly harmful to human health, then the environmental Kuznets curve seems to hold in most cases, in most countries. But for other stuff, and particularly for global stuff like, like climate change or biodiversity, there's no environmental Kuznets curve in sight, right? Um, now, this is all complicated if we introduce uh, international uh, trade. Because the story that I just told you, um, assumes a closed economy. And if we introduce international trade, uh, then things become more complicated still. What you're looking at here is, I promise not to talk about climate, uh, but I do occasionally anyway. Uh, just focus on the top two curve, the brown curve. Um, no, the purple curve, second from the top, are the production emissions of CO2. This is the amount of CO2 that is um, produced in the United Kingdom, or that is emitted in the United Kingdom from fossil fuels that are burned in the United Kingdom, so-called production uh, emissions. 
Um, and what you see is that from 1990 onwards, they've actually been going down for about 20 years or so, ever so slightly, and then that negative trend actually started to accelerate. Uh, and of course, politicians are very proud uh, on that. The uh, curve that you see above it is if we include CO2 emissions from stuff that is imported into the country, that is made, say, in China, but it's sold to the United Kingdom. If we account those CO2 emissions to the United Kingdom, uh, then the picture changes. And of course, we don't just add the imported uh, emissions, but we also subtract the exported uh, emissions, right? The UK exports mostly services, so that is uh, fairly uh, energy uh, and carbon extensive, but it imports a lot of basic goods that are energy and carbon intensive. Um, and what you see is that when production emissions between 1990 and 2010 are falling, consumption emissions are actually rising. And that is because we offshored so much of particularly our heavy production to other countries. Not just China, but also a lot to Eastern uh, Europe. Um, and um, that can be seen in this uh, table here, that if you estimate an environmental Kuznets curve, uh, and that is what is done here in model two, you find that the linear effect is um, nicely um, three stars, right? So significant at the 1% level. And the quadratic effect is uh, significant at the uh, 1% uh, level as well. So that you think is great. And then you look at the signs. <laughs> and then you see the linear effect is negative And the quadratic effect is positive. And that means that you slope downwards first until the effect becomes big enough and then you start sloping upwards, right? <laughs> it's not a Kuznets curve, right? It's the wrong way around. It's supposed to be like this and they find something like this. Um, <clears throat> but then in um, this column here, <clears throat> I think, uh, they throw in international trade Let's focus on this model. Uh, they throw in international trade and the significance on your income and income squared just disappears, right? Boom, it's gone. So as soon as you introduce international trade into these models, your um, results change dramatically uh, again, right? And your environmental Kuznets curve that wasn't there in the first place. <laughs> Um, disappears. You can also do this graphically. Uh, what we're looking at are uh, income per capita on the horizontal axis, uh, emissions for production in tons per capita on the vertical axis for cities in China, for cities in the UK, for cities in the US. And uh, you sort of like see a relationship there. Um, then in the next graph, we're looking at the relationship between production emissions on the horizontal axis and consumption emissions on the vertical axis. And there is somewhat of a relationship there, but it's not definitely not one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, so if you plot the relationship um, Now, I was sure that I understood this. Um, ah, uh, <laughs> I corrected this graph, but I did not know a correction was coming. I was just reading the graph. If we replace production cons emissions with, with consumption uh, emissions, you actually see uh, a different relationship pop up, and actually um, a um, smoother uh, relationship, right? And then this one shows the difference uh, between the two. And the only place where we see something like a Kuznets curve is actually when we look at the ratio, or rather the difference between consumption and production uh, emissions, right? 
Uh, so if you introduce international trade, things become more complicated still, and some of the results that people thought they had previously uh, disappeared. Um, we can also look at the environmental goodness curve over time. So, so far the results that I showed, the Rosman Kruger uh, results and the results that I just showed, are for cross sections between countries or between cities in the one that I just showed you. Uh, this is uh, CO2 emissions from the United States um, over time. So what we're comparing here is a poorer United States. Uh, this is around 1880. That's how far the records go back, um, up to uh, 2010 or so. Uh, and in uh, red, you're looking at uh, CO2 emissions per capita. And there what you see is an increase and then a flattening. Uh, in green, you're looking at CO2 emissions divided by total economic output. Uh, and there you see something like a well-defined uh, peak, right? Uh, it's, I believe it was around 1917, if I recall correctly, that until 1917 emissions per dollar value added were going up, and after that they came uh, down, right? Now, for those of you who know the economic history of the United States or who know the number of people in the United States and population growth in the United States, that's perhaps the easier one. So the red curve sort of flattens, right? It's been basically flat for a few decades now. The number of people in the United States keep growing, right? So the scale effect actually overwhelms uh, this. So also here, you may see something like an environmental goods net curve in intensities, but not in total emissions. And of course, what matters for the environment is the total stuff that we emit, not the total stuff normalized by how much economic output uh, we have, right? Um, <clears throat> so, um, I uh, started this whole story with um, uh, Kruger, right, uh, and we should not speak ill of the death or uh, of the dead even, uh, or make fun of them, uh, but this is actually uh, somewhat uh, funny. Um, so Kruger made his name together with um, the uh, recent uh, Nobel laureates, Inmans and Card and Engrist, uh, the names I'm looking for, um, for what is now known as the credibility uh, revolution. The idea that as economists, and definitely as empirical economists, we should be looking for causal relationships between things. And we should not just run regressions, but we should try and identify um, <coughs> whether X causes Y, not just whether X is associated with Y or correlated with Y, but no, we're actually looking for causation. And uh, Kruger was actually one of the very first uh, behind uh, that movement, um, which I fully uh, support. Um, <clears throat> the environmental Kuznets curves that I've been showing are not causal at all. They are an association. They simply say, well, if the people grow richer, then pressure on the environment first goes up and then comes down. And some people may sort of like draw the conclusion from that, and many people have drawn the conclusion from that, that we can solve our environmental problems by growing richer. All we need to do is stimulate economic growth and environmental problems will solve themselves. Maybe the conclusion you <laughs> drew from this. But that is not at all the case, right? Because the studies are not causal, they're an association. They're actually uh, pretty uh, weak and not robust, uh, but definitely they're not causal uh, at all. Um, <clears throat> and um, that, I think, is best illustrated with an example. 
Uh, and the example I'm going to use is uh, cycling. Uh, what you're looking at here is a few years old, is the cycle paths um, in Europe, all of them. Well, in the part of Europe that is shown. Uh, and you see quite stark differences between certain parts of Europe, right? Uh, the Netherlands, uh, because the resolution is turned all red, so is actually good bits of uh, Germany um, and actually into Eastern Europe. France, Belgium is also pretty red. Oh, Northern France is a bit red, but uh, France itself is pretty not. Italy, the UK, somewhere in between, right? And this is, of course, a pattern uh, you, can, you can't see Denmark because it's cut off. And this, of course, that is a pattern that is well known. Uh, if you guys uh, from the UK travel to uh, Western Europe, you look at this, the, the bikes on the road and you are amazed by the number uh, of them, right? Similarly, if European, if continentals come to the UK, they are amazed at the lack of bicycles on the road and the dominance of uh, cars. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the Netherlands is, of course, the poster child of this. Sometimes it's Denmark, but I have a story prepared for the Netherlands, so I'm going to say that the Netherlands is the poster child uh, of this. And people, including many people from the Netherlands, think it has always been thus. It's always been the case that the Netherlands has been dominated by bicycles. Which is of course not true because the bicycle was invented only 150 years ago. Uh, but the assumption is that right from the start of the invention of bicycles, the Netherlands has been dominated uh, by this particular mode of transport. That is not true. Um, here we're looking at six pictures, uh, two streets uh, in Amsterdam. Um, this is the 1920s, the 1930s, no cars, as you can see. There were very few cars then. Uh, this is the 1960s, and you see lots of cars on the road. And actually you see... Uh, uh, you see the cars, the roads completely dominated by cars, much as English cities are now. Uh, and then these are recent pictures, and this is the Netherlands that you know, where there's few cars in the city and lots of bikes, uh, as well as people uh, walking. Uh, and you sort of see an environmental goodness curve here, right? Few cars, lots of cars, little cars. A uh, few cars, right? Um, <clears throat> And the question is, what happened, right? How can it be that the Netherlands in the 1960s and the 1970s was dominated by car transport, much as the UK is now, but it is no longer? What happened that this uh, car domination disappeared? Um, and uh, the answer actually is in uh, this particular story. Um, this is uh, a picture from 1950 to 2016 onwards um, about the number of people killed in uh, traffic accidents uh, by a mode of uh, transport. Uh, so these are pedestrians killed, these are cyclists killed, uh, and these are people on mopeds, right? Um, and what you see is a peak in traffic deaths in 73, maybe 72, uh, and then a gradual decline. You also see that the composition uh, changes. Uh, there's a second composition, and that is by the age uh, of people. Um, so zero to, you actually understand this, right? The previous one was in dots, but this one you understand. <laughs> uh, zero to 14, uh, 15 to 19. And particularly what you see is that the drop in the number of traffic deaths uh, was heavily concentrated in the younger part of the population. Um, and that is actually key. So the Netherlands was dominated by cars 
and children did not have a place to play and streets were not safe for children and a lot of them got killed, right? And an increasing number of people got fairly upset by that. Um, and then what happened was that a child of a prominent journalist was killed by a car as well. And he started uh, what we would now call an NGO uh, and star uh, started um, essentially a protest movement, right? And that was called uh, Stop the Child Murder, right? A fairly graphic name for what they stood for, right? Um, and the result was that sort of the, this is another picture from Amsterdam, right? Completely overrun by cars. Um, what you see here is some of the protests that took place in the mid 1970s. Essentially, people just blocked the street with bikes, uh, people surrounded uh, cars. It wasn't very pleasant to be in that car. Uh, it was, <laughs> tempers were <laughs> getting pretty high, uh, blockades of streets, and so on uh, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> And essentially what the people of the cities, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Utrecht, and so on and so forth said was get rid of the cars, right? Now, again, there's diverging stories about this. Uh, you could say, well, the Netherlands was a democratic country. And therefore, if the people say get rid of the cars, politicians follow uh, and got rid of the cars. Uh, that is this naive version of this story. Uh, actually, if you listen to political scientists, they will tell you, well, actually, this whole movement led to much more direct democracy in the Netherlands than was, there was previously. This protest movement actually stimulated uh, a sort of more vibrant uh, mode of democracy in the country. And as a result, you now see Amsterdam as you guys before today thought Amsterdam had always been. No, Amsterdam was very uh, different. And the moral of this story is that um, environmental cleanup doesn't just happen, it doesn't just happen be as we grow richer, but it actually takes active intervention from people, from companies, but particularly from the government to clean this up, right? Uh, that is the moral uh, of this particular uh, story. Now, let's return uh, to the environmental Kutznets curve per se, uh, because that's the lead in for the topic uh, after the break. Um, so I looked at the environmental Kutznets curve between countries, I looked at it uh, with and without uh, international trade. I looked at it uh, over time. We can also look at these things within uh, countries. <clears throat> uh, and here is another empirical result uh, due to Matt Kahn, uh, who you say here. And what we're looking at on the uh, vertical axis is CO2 emissions uh, <clears throat> from transport, personal transport. And on the horizontal axis, we're looking at income classes. Now, what you see is an inverted environmental Kutznets curve, right? Poor people put a lot of pressure on the environment, a lot of CO2 emissions. Rich people emit a lot too, and in between people actually emit the least, right? This is the exact opposite of the environmental Kutznets curve. Um, <coughs> And the reason uh, for this particular pattern is fairly straightforward. That is that poor people drive shitty old cars, right? Which are very uh, inefficient, fuel inefficient. Um, they also may drive longer distances because poorer people cannot afford uh, expensive houses. And that means that they tend to live further away from their place of work. And in the US, further away can be quite far. Um, <clears throat> um, if you look at Aspen, for instance, one of the 
uh, big ski resorts as well as a summer tourism resort uh, in Colorado where all the rich people go. Well, those rich people do not clean their own houses, obviously. You have poor people for that. Um, but because house prices are so high in and around Aspen, the people who actually do the basic services in Aspen typically have to drive one and a half to two hours to get there, right? So that is distance uh, in the United And that's a one-way commute, right? Um, so they drive shitty cars and they drive them long distance. Um, richer people tend to drive bigger, heavier cars, right? And may also uh, drive more uh, and therefore uh, put a lot of pressure on the environment in that way, right? And then in between people are somewhere in between. They tend to drive uh, newer, more compact cars and therefore um, put less pressure on the environment. <clears throat> so we can also look at the relationship between putting pressure on the environment across society. Not just between societies, but also across uh, society. Uh, this is a similar picture, but now for uh, Ireland. Um, and on the uh, vertical axis, we're looking not at carbon dioxide, but at carbon monoxide. Um, scales, right? Uh, causes cancer, but too much carbon monoxide will kill you a bit quicker than that. Um, again, for the income distribution, the uh, dark blue are the emissions within the household. The light blue are the emissions from stuff that the household bought, right? Um, so this is uh, the income distribution. Again, poorer people tend to use poor equipment. <laughs> it's not very well maintained, and therefore they emit a lot of uh, carbon monoxide in the house. Uh, also a difference between ru rural and urban. This is essentially lawnmowers, right? Make the big difference. Uh, dirty things. Um, uh, household size makes a difference too. That's essentially because there's economies of scale in energy use. So if you live in, on your own in a house, you heat the same amount as if you live with more people in a house. Actually, because the human body uh, radiates heat. If you have more people in the house, you actually need to heat less, right? Because you keep each other warm. Um, so uh, that ex basically explains uh, this pattern that you see here. Um, this is uh, essentially type of family. Uh, this one uh, is one that you don't see often. Uh, disability uh, number of disabled people in uh, the household. Where uh, disabled people st tend to spend more time at home, therefore use more energy uh, at home. And that is uh, what you see uh, here. If you have a household with three or more disabled people in, um, then uh, emissions actually go down a little bit, direct emissions in the household. Uh, but you also see that the light blue almost completely disappears, and that is because these people tend to be desperately poor. So they buy very, very, very little uh, anyway. Um, so those things um, can be done. It can also be done over time. Uh, this is perhaps um, the... Um, most interesting and perhaps the most scary graph that you'll see. This is again for the United States, and I apologize for that. that a lot of this stuff has been much better documented for the United States than uh, elsewhere. Um, what we're looking at here is not so much over time, but over the AIDS distribution. And this is the, uh, the childhood exposure to lead by age group. Uh, so these are the very young uh, and these are the very old. And that of course means that this was 2015. So these people are 80, about 80 now. And of course, when they were children, this is 70 years ago, right? So we're looking across the age distribution about things that happened in their childhood. So this is recent exposure to lead. This is older exposure to lead. Um, 
the blue means low exposure, the red means high uh, exposure. Um, and, <laughs> and what you see, say roughly through time, is this is the expansion of uh, car transport, right? Road transport. And it used to be that there was a lot of lead in gasoline and in diesel. And then we started to get worried about that. Not so much about lead, but we started to get worried about other stuff that came out. Uh, uh, a lot of urban air pollution, uh, ozone, uh, ni uh, nitrogen, uh, phosphor, and all those sort of things. Sulfur that came out of cars. So what we did was we said cars must have catalytic converters to take out those urban air polluters. The problem with lead is that it clogs up your catalytic converter. So we said, well, if we're going to get rid of the urban air pollution that comes from transport, we also need to switch to lead-free gasoline and lead-free diesel. That was never the primary purpose, uh, but it did happen. Uh, and that is uh, what you see here, that the lead disappears from uh, the environment. There's still a little bit of lead uh, in the environment. Uh, two main sources. One is old pipes um, for, to get drinking water into your house. Uh, there's still some of them are made of lead, uh, and more so in some of the older cities with Victorian um, uh, drinking water uh, provision. The other main source of lead is in uh, paint. Again, if you buy paint now, there is no lead in it anymore, but those houses that were painted 40 years ago, and some of you may live in such houses that were painted 40 years ago, um, if you do, don't eat the paint, because well, you shouldn't eat paint in the first place, but uh, really don't, because they're full of lead, right? And lead is pretty bad for you. So why, do we, <laughs> why are we concerned about this? Right, is the next question. Um, Lead has two effects on the brain. One, it impairs cognitive uh, development. That is, people who are exposed to a lot of lead when they are young are dumber than people who are not. As simple as that. And two, people who are exposed to lead uh, in early childhood are more aggressive than people who are not. And these are by now effects that have been pretty much established, right? Um, now, <clears throat> the 50 to 60, this is 2015, right? So the 15 to, uh, the 50 to 60 year olds now, right? So we see two things in this graph for the United States. One, we see the crime wave, the violent crime wave in the 1980s, done mostly by young men who were young then, right? That crime wave disappeared later. And one of the explanations seems to be the disappearance of lead, or the appearance for lead made them aggressive, the disappearance of lead. And of course, I mean, these people are still, but now they're 50, right? So they won't go up and beat up people anymore like they used to when they were 20. Uh, they're still pretty aggressive, but uh, they act less on it, right? So, so that is one effect that you see. The other effect, uh, effect that some people have discerned here is that these are the Trump, Trump voters. This is MAGA America, right? This is the bulk of the sort of the extreme right way. If you listen to what they say, if you watch videos on YouTube about what these people say, you think they're just complete idiots, right? How can you possibly believe this stuff? But if you know that these people have been cognitively impaired when they were young, well, yeah, it becomes more plausible. Now, this is for the United States. The pattern for the United Kingdom, we don't have uh, as well documented as here, but we introduced a lot of leaded gasoline at the same time, and we got rid of leaded gasoline uh, at the same time as the United States did. So the pattern must be the same for the United Kingdom. 
and then you can wonder who vote tor who vote story right and you can genuinely say to your father i am smarter than you right because you probably are and you can say the same thing to me right because i'm part of the generation x uh, never understood those things uh, i'm part of what is here denoted as generation x now concerns about uh pressure on the environment <laughs> um i'm going to talk about environmental justice after the break so what we have here established in the first uh, hour is that pressure on the environment is different for different socioeconomic groups and you immediately smell there is something unfair about all this right and that is what we're going to talk about after uh, the break right i'm going to see you at five past three. okay let's continue um this uh, lecture comes with some trigger warnings uh, so if you get upset by these things it's not what i it is what i say right not what i mean necessarily but some of the things uh, that i'm going to say are not essentially uh not pretty nice uh about people so i talked about uh, how different parts of society put different pressure on the environment um and it actually things go much further uh, than that uh, this is uh, discussed in the wider literature under the name of environmental justice um this is not a name that you are uh, uh, words that you see often in the economics literature uh, but if you look a little bit deeper uh, you can find it uh, anyway um now on the uh, on canvas there's the usual uh, videos by me right but on this topic i've also uh, included some videos of people who are less privileged uh, than myself right uh, and who speak of this from their own perspective rather than uh, from an outsider uh, but let's look uh, at some data first what you're looking at here is again the united states uh, because as i said things have been uh, documented much better there uh, jonathan colmer is actually an englishman um, but he decided to work with uh, us data because they are they are there uh, we started in 1981 we end up in uh, 2016 and we're looking at particulate matter two and a half that is then very fine particulate matter two and a half stands for uh, micron which is i think a millionth uh, of a meter <laughs> if i'm not mistaken uh, and these are these very fine particles that come from all sorts of activities mostly from uh, fossil fuel combustion uh, but also from mining and uh, those sort of things uh, pm two and a half is particularly dangerous because it's so tiny that it just goes through everything so being indoors actually does not really help because it just goes through the window right <laughs> even if the window is closed um and also it just gets into you right uh, and it's so fine that actually uh, it also gets into your brain uh, because the normal brain membrane that you have around your brain keeps out a lot of bad stuff but not this this is too fine for that and and there are indications that pm two and a half actually interferes with the neurons in your brain and we've definitely seen a lot of evidence uh, of people making very strange decisions uh, when exposed to a lot of pm two and a half um from go ahead they don't know uh, there's definitely acute uh, things uh, some, some of the things are just funny right so there is a, a paper that shows that on um, with high pm two and a half concentrations referees in uh, sport matches make silly decisions that's been documented for baseball and for tennis and you think that's just funny right um it's also been shown that the same is true for uh, chess players and you think uh, that is funny right uh, because you don't care about chess players that much right 
Uh, also, stockbrokers make bad decisions, and at the moment you guys don't have pensions, so you think that's funny, but people like me who do rely on our pension and who do hope for a pension are actually not too keen on uh, stockbrokers making silly decisions. Uh, but it's also been shown actually for students in exams. Uh, in a university not too far from here, of a diverse campus, when students sit in an exam in a polluted environment, they do worse than when they sit the same students or a random selection of students do worse than when they sit in a pristine environment. And actually the difference there is not small, but a difference there is between a first and a two one, right? So that will cost you how much during your lifetime? A few million, right? <clears throat> so this, this is important stuff, right? Now, fortunately, in the United States, what we've seen is that the PM2.5 concentration has been falling and has been falling steadily for 40 years, 45 years or so in this graph. Um, <clears throat> but uh, this is not uniform. Here we're looking at a map. In blue, you're looking at those areas where PM2.5 concentrations have been falling. In brown, we're looking at those areas where it has been increasing. And you can like sort of see the history uh, of economic geography in the United States here, right? The Rust Belt, slow uh, economic decline, uh, the Sun Belt, you see uh, <coughs> the uh, increase in economic uh, activity. Now, for those of you who know a little bit about the population in the United States and where people live and what is their racial uh, makeup, uh, should not be surprised by uh, these uh, set of results. Um, at the, um, okay, overall PM2.5 has been falling across the United States, right? If we look at the difference in this rate between rich and poor, nothing much there, right? The, uh, you, from where you sit, you can probably not see the difference between the uh, orange line and the blue line. Uh, same if we focus on uh, Hispanic people in the United States. Again, the two trends are basically identical. But if we look at white people versus black people, you actually see a substantial difference, right? And the darker skinned population in the United States are more exposed to PM2.5 than the lighter skinned uh, population. Now that is true graphically, it's also true when you run a regression. Um, <clears throat> now this is not just for PM2.5. Um, this is a map, two maps uh, of Houston. Um, in at the top map, the red areas is where are waste facilities. So uh, uh, landfills, right, where we just dump our waste, as well as incineration uh, of waste. Where do we burn the stuff? Uh, and you see that there's a clear pattern there. Uh, it's on one side of the city, but not on the other side of the city. Now, if you look at where do minorities live in Houston, that is the bottom uh, map. It's in the uh, red, orange, and yellow areas. And the two, are, the two geographical patterns are actually not that different. Um, I'll come back to the reasons uh, later. Um, if we move to uh, Virginia, to Richmond, um, again, this is a map uh, of the city. Uh, what we're looking at here is temperature. And the, the darker the color, the hotter it gets. So temperature is never uniform, right? As always, there's hotter places. Even when it's very hot, there are still places that are hotter still, right? Uh, this has a lot to do with such things as the building materials that are used. Some building materials uh, absorb the heat, others reflect it. It depends on the color of the roads, right? Black uh, roads get much hotter than 
gray or white roads, so there's also the color of the buildings uh, matters in that regard. That is why in the Mediterranean you see typically white houses, whereas here in the UK we actually have much darker colored uh, houses. That has to do with local climate uh, management essentially. Uh, but also such things as the number of water bodies uh, that are there, the number of trees that are there, and so on and so forth. They all determine the microclimate. Uh, and what you see is quite stark differences in temperature uh, within a fairly confined uh, area. I mean, Richmond is not the biggest city in the world, right? It's not the smallest either, but not the biggest uh, uh, city in the world. Um, <coughs> And uh, here we see some uh, of the same things, right? So uh, what they did here was they cut up the city into polygons, essentially more or less homogeneous uh, places in terms of economic activity and population. Um, and here you see the temperature uh, distribution and you see stark differences between the green uh, and the red. Um, similarly, here we're looking at uh, tree cover and you see actually the opposite effect, right? In places where there's lots of trees, it is much cooler. In places where there's little trees, it's much hotter. Uh, and here we're looking at impervious uh, surface, uh, which has to, partly to do with temperature management, but also has to do with water management. If you have a surface that absorbs water in excess of spawns, and when it rains really hard, the water just disappears. If you have a lot of hard surfaces, impervious surfaces, and it rains really hard, you get a flash flood, right? And you have a flooding uh, problem. Um, <coughs> and that also you see systematic uh, differences uh, there. Now what I haven't told you is what do these colors mean, right? Uh, and for our one American in the room uh, probably knows what redlining means, but the rest uh, doesn't. Uh, the red areas have been redlined, and the orange areas have been sort of vaguely redlined. Um, and that was a practice in the 1930s. This was way before the civil rights movement. This was when America essentially had an apartheid regime, right? That, yes, slavery had been abolished, but it didn't mean that people of different skin color were equal in any way before the law, and there was very explicit, um, explicit uh, racism. Not the sort of subtle, implicit racism that we still see nowadays, no, very explicit uh, type of uh, racism. Um, and the redlining uh, that took place in Richmond uh, at the time was um, essentially all local authorities were asked to draw up areas of the city that were worthy of investment and where that investment was worthy of public support. So essentially it was said this quarter of town, that's a good part of town and we want businesses to invest there and we're going to set up schools and we're going to build roads to help those businesses, right? And then there was also parts of town that were redlined. Essentially, somebody drew a red line on a map around this and said, well, these parts of town are not good for investment by businesses, and we're also not going to build roads and schools and that sort of stuff, right? And what you see, and this was done in the 1930s, uh, and what you see is that now, or this was published in 2008, so this data is from 2015, 2018 or so. Almost now, you see that what happened in the 1930s, almost 100 years later, you still can see in the natural environment, right? In tree cover, in uh, flood risk, uh, and in temperature. Um, and that redlining was not done on the grounds of this is a bad part of town but it was done on the skin color of the people who lived there. So in those areas where a lot of blacks lived, those areas were redlined, right? So this is very explicit racism, <clears throat> right? Um, now, where do these patterns come from? Why do they persist for 100 years? Where does this pattern come from? Uh, essentially, um, 
we found is that uh, environmental hazards tend to be cited near the poor and deprived. And there are a number uh, of reasons for that. One goes back to what we've done in the lecture on hedonic pricing on stated preferences, right? What we found is that in areas with a nice environment, with little environmental pollution, lots of greenery and nice lakes around, house prices are higher. Now, if house prices are higher, then what happens is what some people call gentrification, right? The poor people move out because they cannot afford to live there, and definitely poor people do not move in because they cannot afford to live there, right? So because of this interaction between <laughs> environmental quality and house prices, what you have is over time, that nicer areas, cleaner areas, become more expensive, and therefore, this is where the rich live, right? <clears throat> so that is just one, and that reinforces itself, right? Um, so that is one part of the explanation. Uh, and I mean, you would see the same, uh, say, if you would look at Bangladesh, right? Where do the poor live? <laughs> they live on the floodplain. And why do they live on the floodplain? Because uh, uh, land prices are so very cheap there. Why are they so very cheap there? Because every once in a while uh, the river comes and washes everything away, right? And everybody in their right mind who can afford not to live there would live higher up on the hill, right? And it's sort of the areas uh, that are exposed to flooding, that is where the poor people live. If you look at any shanty town uh, in a mountainous area, where do the poor live? on the steep hillsides, right? When, when it rains very heavily, <laughs> the whole mountain comes down and takes you and your house and your children uh, with it, right? Whereas richer people, I mean, poor people know the risk, right? But they have no choice. Richer people look at it and say, yeah, houses are cheap there, but I can afford to live someplace safer, right? So this is uh, immediate. Now, the second thing uh, <clears throat> that is um, crucially important here um, is that richer people are, do not just have more money, but they also tend to be better educated and they tend to be better connected. And when you're talking about um, my computer froze. Um, when you're talking about the siting of, say, waste incineration facility, this is decided by local authorities, typically. And local authorities are democratic. They want to be uh, elected, but they also want to keep the press on their side. Uh, they want to keep donations coming from people, right? So immediately richer people can donate more. Better educated people are better at writing letters, angry letters to the newspaper, because they are better at formulating uh, stuff, right? Formulating grievances. They know how sort of the local authorities work and how to start a petition and how to start a complaint and all those sort of things without much help uh, from outsiders. Or they may be journalists uh, or something themselves, right? Recall the story about the Netherlands where this whole movement was started by a very influential journalist. There is somebody at the top end of society, right? It was not the first child uh, that was killed, but it was the child of the influential guy that triggered the whole thing. <clears throat> um, so we say we live in a democracy where everybody's vote is equal. But in reality, richer people, better connected people, better educated people have more influence on what society does than uh, other people, right? And that is how these things perpetuate uh, themselves. Um, and in the US, it actually goes uh, further. Uh, this was after another very big hurricane. Uh, <coughs> Uh, Laura, a few years ago, a chemical plant caught fire, as they sometimes do. Uh, when uh, a big storm comes, the electricity goes out, or there's water there. Uh, and the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, has actually identified sacrifice zones. 
where sometimes when a big storm comes, you can't save everything and everybody, and the so-called sacrifice zones are saved last. And they're explicitly defined. This is not 1930s. <laughs> this is 2020s, um, where uh, communities of color, lower wealth communities, are saved last, right? And this continues to uh, today. <clears throat> um, so, very unfortunate, very unfair. Uh, if you get cross about these things, don't get cross with me, because I'm just the messenger here, right? Um, so, uh, now there's one implication uh, of this, or another implication that I haven't talked about. Um, if it is true that different parts of society are affected differentially by uh, environmental pollution, and I think I have convinced you that that is the case, um, then of course an environmental cleanup also has differential effects and actually primarily benefits uh, the um, poorer parts, uh, the more deprived parts of uh, society. <clears throat> And for this, I actually have some UK data, or rather some data from uh, London. Um, so what you're looking at here is a map of Greater uh, London. Um, <coughs> that's what he said, right? Yes. Um, this, I'm pretty sure, is the M25. I'm pretty sure that this is the M25. The two maps are the same. We can't see the M25 uh, here. Uh, on <laughs> this map, this is a map of traffic, uh, traffic density, right? Uh, or rather, uh, this is a map of noise pollution uh, from traffic in London. That is what it is. Um, Greater London. <clears throat> This is a map based on, no doubt, the 2021 uh, census of multiple deprivation. And the uh, darker the color, uh, the more deprived uh, people uh, are, right? Um, so the red bits is where the poor people are, the light red, uh, the dark red bits is where the poor people are, the light red bits is where the rich people are. Uh, are in London. Um, that's uh, what I needed uh, to uh, say. Um, I'm pretty sure that is noise. Uh, the next map is actually um, more important. Uh, at the top, you're looking at uh, NO2, and that's uh, air pollution. Um, it's chemical air pollution, uh, and PM10 is essentially small particles, not quite as small as two and a half, but still, these, if these get into your lungs, you develop all sorts of stuff, stuff that you do not want. Um, and now we're not looking at the emissions, but we're looking at the change in emissions that would come about when the what is it called again? The low emission zone would be extended further out. The low emission zone a while back started in a fairly small part of London and has now been extended to a much larger part of London. And the question is what happens to NO2 emissions and PM10 emissions if that would happen? It actually has happened. This was pre, uh, pre the change uh, in policy. <clears throat> and you see that uh, actually in most parts, so the scale here is the red are increases in emissions and the green are decreases in emissions. Now what you, see, what you see is that most of the map is green, right? So for most of Greater London, this is actually a good thing. You see some displacement of activity to the southern reaches, we're down in Surrey, maybe even in Sussex, uh, and the northern reaches uh, of Greater London, but by and large, over London, you see a decrease uh, in pollution, both for NO2 and for PM10. Uh, and then that is blown up here for the inner uh, city. Um, <clears throat> now, if we then translate this to 
um, classes of people, uh, the following uh, result emerges. So this is the chains on the vertical axis. You're looking at the chains in pollution. In orange is the end. I'm pretty sure it's NO2 uh, and not N2O. Um, yeah, it's NO2, sorry for that. Um, and the other, uh, <laughs> NO2 is laughing gas, that's a green, and uh, 2 is laughing gas, that's a greenhouse gas that has just been banned. You're no longer to make, uh, have fun with that over the weekend uh, because of our uh, wonderful government. And, and, and 2 if you just inhale it into your lungs, your voice gets funny, and you start laughing at all sorts of things, and that's why it's called laughing gas. It's perfectly innocent, right? Don't worry about damage to your health. Uh, NO2, on the other hand, is pretty bad for you, but also it doesn't make you giggle, so there's no reason for you to take it. Um, but here, uh, I, I put the two in the wrong place. Um, <laughs> so uh, in orange, we're looking at the decrease because of the extension of the low emission zone uh, in uh, NO2 emissions, and in blue, in PM10 emissions. Um, and then, uh, <clears throat> On the horizontal axis, we're looking at uh, the index of multiple deprivation, uh, where these are the well-off people and these are the poorest uh, people, right? Um, and what you see here is indeed, as you may have guessed, if pollution primarily hits the poor, then if you clean up the pollution, you primarily benefit uh, the poor, right? Um, <clears throat> Now this is just in concentrations of stuff that doesn't mean anything uh, to you, right? Um, here it is translated into years of life gained. So this is stuff that makes you ill uh, and makes you die prematurely. So if you take it away, people tend to live longer. Uh, and what you see here is, <coughs> and this is per 100,000 people, uh, for the very poor, uh, about 65 years per 100,000 people is gained, uh, whereas for the richer, it's, that goes down to 40. Um, and it's mostly, as you can see in the orange, it's mostly due to NO2, not N2O. It's just perfectly innocent, uh, as I said. Um, now, this was done by Ken Livingston here on the phone with Hitler. Uh, and as you know, Ken was called Red Ken. Uh, sort of the hard left uh, of labor, and he did what he was supposed to do. He worked primarily for the poorer part of his uh, constituents. Um, so this is all uh, good, right? Um, now, I have 17 minutes left for one slide. Um, The summary of what I just said is uh, relatively uh, clear, I think. So environmental pollution primarily hits the poorer parts, the less well-connected, um, the less well-educated parts of society. It's pretty bad, and sometimes that is very explicit racism, right? Uh, as we saw with the redlining in the United States, that was 100 years ago, but still plays out today. Um, also, um, <coughs> also a almost explicit ra racism in the sacrifice zones of the current uh, EPA, right? Um, the flip side of this is if you clean up the environment, also those people that were primarily hurt or disproportionately hurt by this will also disproportionately benefit, right? Now, immediately against that goes the fact that a lot of environmental problems come from energy and come from agriculture. And these are necessary goods. And typically, if you want to clean up energy use, if you want to clean up agriculture, you make stuff more expensive. And if environmental problems primarily come from energy and agriculture, and you're making fuel and food more expensive, 
then poorer people pay more of their income towards necessary goods by definition, right? That's the definition of a necessary good. Uh, and energy and agriculture are necessary goods. So if you make this stuff more expensive to clean up the environment, you do not only disproportionately benefit the poor because they suffer most from environmental pollution, but you also increase their prices by more than the rest of society, right? So environmental policy may be progressive in the sense that it helps the poor the most. Thanks, Ken. Uh, but it also actually makes their life harder, right? And it's unclear how the balance uh, falls. Um, <clears throat> So it is more complicated than what I just uh, said. Um, and then uh, there is, of course, the role of the environmental movement uh, in all this, right? Um, in either the first or the second lecture, I think it was the first, I talked about the environmental or the romantic uh, roots of environmentalism, right? Uh, and I also said, well, there's actually two other modern movements that have their roots in Romanticism, that is Communism, uh, and that is Nazism and Fascism, right? <clears throat> and of course, uh, particularly Nazism has this strong uh, racist uh, overtones. Um, well, <laughs> not overtones, has strong racist uh, component, right? Fascism uh, has uh, the same uh, characteristic. Um, and some of that also you still see in the environmental uh, movement. Now, <clears throat> did I show this video of the Greens singing Kein Schöner Land? I think I did. Uh, or did I do that last year? Um, <clears throat> environmentalists have not fully shed their racist attitudes, unfortunately. This is not true for all environmentalists. Uh, but you'd still hear uh, racist overtones in the environmental movement uh, to today. So one of the most prominent uh, environmental families, environmentalist families uh, in this country is the royal family, right? Uh, we know the king uh, and what he has said, we used to say about these things, he's no longer allowed to speak. Uh, but the heir to the throne, soon to be Prince of Wales, still Duke of Cambridge, uh, last year said that there were too many children. Now, he did not refer to his own three children, right? Who live in big houses, who travel by helicopter or by private plane, right? He did not refer to those three children. He referred to children in general. He referred to very high birth rates. And you see that primarily in Africa, right? So when the soon-to-be Prince of Wales says too many children, he means too many black children, right? He does not mean too many white, white children and definitely not too many children with the surname Windsor, right? That is not what he means. Um, <clears throat> and you still see, and whenever somebody worries about the population bomb and there being too many kids around, there are almost always racist overtones uh, on that. And sometimes environmental, move, uh, environmental NGOs are very explicitly uh, racist. Um, <coughs> and uh, you probably all heard of WWF, the World Wide Fund for Nature. Uh, you probably will not have doubt that sort of they sell these cuddly toys and you can adopt a leopard or an elephant or things like that. And you get, people get very excited about that. And they all seem good and cuddly and those sort of things. Um, <clears throat> the Worldwide Fund for Nature was set up with a very explicit purpose in the period of the end of empire, or rather I should say the end of empires, uh, but definitely the British Empire uh, was a big part of that. Uh, and the people who started the World Wide Fund for Nature were worried about nature, obviously. Uh, not really how you and I probably see nature. They were worried about losing their hunting grounds. They were worried about that the post-colonial uh, regimes would not grant the same privileges 
as the British and the Dutch and the French Empire uh, had to the nobility and the royalty and the very rich uh, parts of society to go and shoot elephants uh, and lions. They were worried that they would be excluded from their hunting grounds. And that is why they set up Worldwide Fund for Nature, <clears throat> right? To make sure that those blacks don't kick us out of our hunting grounds. That was the explicit purpose of Worldwide Fund for Nature. And the two uh, main drivers, uh, the two key figures in setting up the Worldwide Fund for Nature, one was a member of the Hitler Jugend, and the other was a member of the Afrikaner Bruderbond. Now, the Hitler Jugend doesn't need any introduction because you've all learned about World War II uh, in school. You've learned very little about apartheid uh, in uh, uh, school, but the Afrikaner Bruderbond uh, is one of the driver organizations behind the apartheid regime uh, then in South Africa, right? After these two guys stepped back, one of the guys who took over the World Wide Fund for Nature was the Duke of Edinburgh, who is also well known for what we now call gaps, right? Uh, whenever he's confronted with somebody of a different uh, skin color. Um, <clears throat> and the World Wide Fund for Nature has not shed this, right? There have been regular reports when they sort of like collect money in the West to protect uh, forests in Africa and then they go in and enthusiastically beat up the locals, right? Because they want to save the pygmy sloth, uh, but they care, lair, care less about the people we call pygmies, right? Uh, so there are still these environmental overtones that were so very explicit in the roots of environmentalism, you still see that in parts of the environmental movement. Now, to uh, wrap up, eight minutes left, I'm not saying that this is true for the majority uh, of environmentalists. I think this is true for a small minority uh, who are explicitly racist, but you just look at environmental organizations and who is there, it's typically rich white people who uh, are there, right? So you still see a lot of these older traditions and very unfortunate traditions in the environmental movement. That is not to cast a bad light on environmentalism, but this is more a plea to kick out the racism from environmentalism, right? <clears throat>